as you know, hormones and pregnancy can wreak havoc on your body. It can diminish the, your muscle. Uh, it can put fat in very weird places. And even if you're eating the way you used to, your metabolism has changed. And sometimes we just wake up in this weird alien body and don't know <laughs> what to do with it. And I was about 20 pounds overweight. Like it was one of those horrible moments where you stand in front of the mirror in your underwear and you're like, I am not hot at all. <laughs> you know, There is usually a basic uh, level of fitness that they need to attain before we can go full steam ahead into performance or into weight loss. All we have to do is this. I'm going to teach you how to do this part and then let's think about moving beyond that point that you always thought was impossible. I think that's kind of magic. There's actually much smarter ways to go about a lot of this. What's up, guys? This is Alex Van Houten with Defining Dad Bod. I hope you're doing well. Those were just some highlights from the interview you're going to hear today with Miss Sarah Fleming. Sarah's a strength coach of over 20 years who's worked with a number of different athletes from different walks of life and different demographics. As a woman over 40 and mother of three children, something interesting happened, and she decided to pursue a health and fitness goal just for her. We talk about her decision to do so. She drops some awesome knowledge on how to eat for figure with three teenagers in the house. And we map the journey to get out of feeling old and in pain to being able to perform at a great level and then look in the mirror and be proud of what you see. And our conversation today is a perfect launch for what we're doing with the Defining Dad Bod Summer Shred Program. I speak a lot here on Defining Dad Bod about how our health and fitness journey, especially with regard to our kids, has to stand for something bigger than ourselves. It's not about six-pack abs in six weeks. And it's not about the new crazy fad diet that's going to promise you your hopes and dreams in a short period of time. Here at Defining Dad Bod, our health and fitness pursuits are a reflection of our exercise, nutrition, and lifestyle habits that we want to pass on to our kids and that helps us live high-quantity, high-quality lives. That being said, you might ask, then why do we have a summer shred program? Isn't that just like the fads in the fitness industry? Yep, from a marketing perspective, you're kind of right. However, I want to tell you a little bit about how we're doing this differently from the rest of the fitness industry. The Defining Dad Bod Summer Shred Program lasts 16 weeks. It's broken up intelligently into training macro cycles, where we start with the foundations phase of training, move through the endurance phase of training, then hypertrophy, and then athleticism. The goal is to create a great foundation to stave off injury, to build mobility and functionality, and then on top of that, create fat loss, create muscle growth, and then cut nice and hard for the summer. Within this approach, we'll be addressing our hormonal system, insulin, cortisol, testosterone, and thyroid hormone, through intelligent nutrition and lifestyle changes. Each week will be a different focus so that your nutrition and lifestyle change reflect and complement your exercise progress. And when you finish your 16 weeks in the Defining Dad Bod Summer Shred program, not only will you have great results, but you will have built habits over that period of time that are going to stick with you for the long haul. And that's what makes what we do different from the rest of the fitness industry. I'm not interested in you dropping everything cold turkey and doing a great job for 30 days so you can look great in the mirror. I'm interested in you making steady, and consistent changes so that you don't have to tyrannize yourself and so that you can get your family and your community on board with you. Through the 16-week program, we'll be addressing things like sugar consumption, sleep, alcohol intake, gluten sensitivity, and even what supplements you should be taking and what ones are a big waste of your money. And my favorite thing about this whole thing is we put our minds together here at Defining Dad Bod to offer three levels of this service. The first level, the Padawan level, cost 20 bucks a month, and that includes your 16-week e-guide to getting your nutrition and lifestyle to complement your hormone system. You'll also get a profile on True Coach, so you can have personalized results tracking, and you can get an idea of what your weekly workout schedule should look like. Add to that a weekly group coaching session, eight weeks worth of meal plans written by a registered dietitian, and your daily macro recommendation. I believe you can't spend $20 more intelligently in the fitness industry. The next level of help is what we call the apprentice package. It comes with everything that the Padawan package does, the meal plans, the group coaching, the 16-week guide, but you're also told day-to-day -to -day exactly what the right workout looks like for you. 
instead of leaving it up to you to decide what you're going to do for cardio or what you're going to do for weights. I've taken the liberty to program an ideal 16 weeks through the foundations phase, through the endurance phase, through the hypertrophy phase, and through the athleticism phase. All you have to do is show up to the gym, open your workout, and crush it. Each workout comes with videos for each exercise so that there's no question what it is that you're supposed to be getting done. The apprentice package is $50 a month. And just like the Padawan package, I believe that there's no better way you can spend $50 intelligently in the health and fitness world. And for ultimate personalization, we bring you the Jedi package. For $200 a month, you get everything that the Padawan and Apprentice packages get, but we take your program one step further. We start your summer shred with a 30-minute strategy session live with me. We'll talk through medical history and past injuries and equipment that you have available to you so that I can completely personalize the workouts and experience for you through the Summer Shred program. If that bum knee is still bothering you, you have low back pain, or you only have a four-year-old to use as a weight, I can definitely make this program work for you. And in addition to the personalized coaching and accountability that you get through the Padawan and Apprentice packages, Jedi clients get an individualized coaching call monthly to ask their questions, to troubleshoot obstacles, and to further fine-tune the program so that it works well for you. No matter what level of support you need, I want to help you get shredded for summer. But I want to help you do it in a way that's going to last a long time, that you can feel good about, and that's going to set a great example for your kids and your community. The Summer Shred program launches the first week of April, and pre-registration closes on April 5th. So get signed up at definingdadbod.com slash shred. That's definingdadbod.com slash shred. Go check it out, fill out the form, pick your level of accountability, and we'll get going together. definingdadbod.com slash shred. And now that you're super inspired to get shredded with me for the summer, let's see what a strength coach of 20 years and mother of three children has to say about pursuing body composition goals. What's up, guys? This is Alex Van Houten with Defining Dad Bod. I hope you're doing well. I'm super excited to hang out with my guest today, Miss Sarah Fleming. Sarah, how are you doing today, lady? I'm doing great. I'm so excited to hang out with you because, well, actually, just a second ago, your giant dog just interrupted our conversation <laughs> pre-show. <laughs> so hopefully he's gone. But Sarah has a piece of advice for all the guys listening real quick. Uh, you want to go ahead and throw that down for us? I didn't tell you I was going to ask, but no, it's it's a good idea if you hire a contractor to come to the house that you A, let your wife know, and B, that you're there when the person arrives. All right. <laughs> Word of wisdom to all the men listening. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> there's no sense of irony in that piece of advice. Now, Sarah, I brought you on not necessarily to talk about contractors and advice for husbands to wives, but you are a trainer of over, gosh, what? I don't want to age you too late, but <laughs> I'm 46 over... years old. <laughs> oh, okay, well, there you go. She's not shy about it. You've been a trainer for a good amount of time. I'll give you a chance to share your superhero origin story with us, but uh, I wanted you to come on and talk about uh, one of the things that you have recently taken on in your own fitness journey, which is you have been a performance coach for a long time. And recently you decided, hey, I'm going to try a bikini competition. I believe that's how it went. I know there's probably more to it than that. Uh, so before we get to that transformation and that thought process and some of the challenges that you faced in there and whatnot, can you give everybody just a, a brief understanding of your history as a trainer so that uh, we're all brought up to speed about what you do and your area of expertise? Well, it's kind of ironic because um, the first person I started training with at the gym, just a friend of mine. Um, she was a figure competitor. She did the figure in fitness. That's where you stand on stage in a bikini, but then you also do those crazy aerobic, uh, you know, uh, routines where they're doing flips and splits and all kinds of stuff. And it's like, like you're, could, you're a pretty gymnast. Is <laughs> yeah, basically. And I, I was amazed by her. I thought she was, she was pretty incredible. Um, and I started training with her to lose weight after my second child, because as you know, hormones and pregnancy can wreak havoc on your body. It can diminish the, your muscle. Uh, it can put fat in very weird places. And even if you're eating the way you used to, your metabolism has changed. And sometimes we just wake up in this 
weird alien body and don't know <laughs> what to do with it. Uh, yeah. And so she dialed me right in that diet is a big part of it. You're going to have to change the way you eat. Um, we need to do some cardio. We need to build those muscles back up. And in the course of doing this, because I am not a natural athlete and I did not look like a figure competitor, there were women in the gym that felt comfortable coming up to me and approaching me and saying, hey, can I train with you? I really like what transformations you're making. And I felt uh, sort of flattered and obligated, especially when some of these women uh, serendipitously happened to be breast cancer survivors. And prior to becoming a mom, I was a biochemist and medical researcher, and I did a lot of research in breast cancer. So it was sort of like this weird coincidence. And after a while, I decided, well, maybe I'd, I'd like to work with people and, and be a trainer. And I remember my friend being incredulous, like, well, you've never done a bodybuilding competition. What are you, how are you going to train people? And, and I thought to myself, well, I'm not really interested in training people for aesthetics. I'm, train I'm interested in training people to regain just simple function and simply feeling good because that's what this, that process had done for me. So anyway, I got certified. Long story short, I ended up um, working in a CrossFit gym and ran into all kinds of people who, you know, the, at their first instinct is I want six pack abs. But then you realize they've got back pain, they've got joint pain, they've got all these other dysfunctions going on that can be easily repaired with just simple strength training. Let's get you going for a walk every day. Let's get you watching what you're eating. So a much more basic approach. And then serendipitously, I ended up working with a bunch of teenagers one summer and found that they really liked lifting barbells. And so that kind of took me down the path to becoming a, a weightlifting and, and later on a powerlifting coach. And I've worked with all kinds of young athletes and uh, strength athletes, both young and old. And so my approach to things I've definitely taken from my background as a scientist, which is I can get you there. We just need to know, we need the data. Where are you at? What can you do? What do you have access to? How much time do you have? And we will eventually figure out your path to that destination because that's what you do in the lab. You know, you want to map this genome of a mouse. Well, first we need to figure out how to you know, sequence DNA. That's the first step. We never say that's impossible. We just don't know what the steps are yet that we have to take to get there. So I've always worked with folks who maybe were a little intimidated or didn't feel comfortable in, in a more hardcore, high performance based gym, but I've gotten a lot of them to very high levels of performance simply by taking them at their own pace and identifying what they as individuals could improve. Mm -hmm. I love your, we share this as a trainer. I, I see you as a kindred spirit in the training world as the, the scientific approach to training because there's a lot of hashtag science, maybe bro science might be the best way to talk yes. about it. <laughs> uh, the world of, you know, training and health and fitness and whatnot. And, and on the show, we do our best to, you know, wade through that and, and teach people the actual practical application of real meta-analyzed peer-reviewed science, which is not always easy to find in this realm, but you're, um, I don't want to call it simple-minded because it's not simple-minded. It's simply practical approach to point A to point B fitness. It resonates with me. And if it resonates with anybody else while, while they're talking here, you did an interview uh, with me and your business partner on the show for practical strength. And I'll make sure that that link is in yes. the show notes below, but we talked about squatting and we talked about deadlifting and common prat falls and whatnot in the fundamentals of strength training. So if anybody's interested in that, we will direct you there. So Sarah, your background in the performance, when I say performance side of things, I want to make sure the audience understands how you and I both view this. And I don't want to speak for you, so I'll give you an opportunity to comment here. But as a trainer, when I think of fitness goals, I generally pigeonhole, I'm putting my hands in quotes here, pigeonhole clients into a specific type of client by priority of goal, right? So I might, I have one of three client types in my head, and that's the, I want to be healthy client, which is, you know, get off medications, feel more energetic tomorrow, keep up with my grandkids, get out of pain, that sort of thing. That's like my healthy client. And then I have my performance client who's like, I'm training for a Tough Mudder, or I want to increase the strength of my deadlift, or 
I want to compete in the marathon. So something along those lines, there's a performance and athletic goal in mind. And then last but not least is what I call my body composition clients who, you know, hey, come hell or high water, I wanna look different in the mirror a few months from now than I do right now. And, and so I think of my clients in those ways. Now, you and I both know that those goals can overlap, you know, hey, getting off my cholesterol medication might also entail losing 10 pounds of fat and running every now and then, you know, it, it could be combined yeah. together. But when, when I talk about uh, aesthetic goals or body composition goals, in the mind of a strength and conditioning coach, I feel like there's a bad taste in the mouth. Like, like uh, I want to help you learn how to squat and get out of back pain and heal your shoulder injury and, and perform well. And you know what? If you're five pounds heavier than you'd like to be, who cares? Like, <laughs> what's that? And in my experience working with trainers, sometimes I find that the mindset is either or not a combination of yes. both. And so one of the reasons that I, I'm excited to talk to you is, is I know you've never been of that mind. You know, you, you're, a, you're a realistic chick. You started your fitness journey. Well, I'm sure you were doing this before, but after your second kid, you were like, hey, what's going on with my body? I'd really like to at least be some pre-baby Sarah Fleming here, you know? <laughs> and Yes. But at the same time, your fitness journey has been very practical in the sense that, hey, if that causes you back pain, if that's hurting your knees, there's something wrong with that. So tell me a little bit about your mindset with regard to the, the worlds of performance goals versus body composition goals. Do you see those as, as separate worlds or have you combined them in your mind? The way I kind of look at it and the way you were saying you have your first year sort of, I call it... Um, regaining mobility mm -hmm. for either my performance client or my body composition client there is usually a basic uh, level of fitness that they need to attain before we can go full steam ahead into performance or into weight loss mm -hmm. for example if my client is not fit enough to do the things that they need to do to lose weight for example if they have knee pain so walking is hard for them if they have hip pain and they you know can't do a lot of uh, exercise based cardio in the gym i actually had a gal over the summer i worked with who was very heavy and she had a lot of pain and she also had a lot of anxiety she had a lot of anxiety about walking she she had had some history of some blood pressure issues and so whenever her heart rate would get up it would it would scare her um so i started by simply saying, look, the first thing we're gonna do is restore your ability to sit down and get up out of a chair. We're gonna call it squatting, but that's what we're doing. We're going to do, we're gonna strengthen your shoulders. I just had her doing basic ring rows. I had her doing push-ups off a bar. I had her do, standing and, and twisting with a plate. So overall, we're, we're making your body stronger so that you are going to be more conditioned and stronger. And so when you're out by yourself and, and you wanna go for a walk, you're not gonna feel so helpless or like, I'm going to get to this point and I'm just not going to be able to get back. Mm -hmm. And then the funny enough, I talked her into going out in my driveway and pushing the prowler one day <laughs> and, and she did it. And because she had confidence in her hip strength and she knew she could stop whenever she wanted because I wasn't standing there yelling at her. And by the end of summer, she was, you know, again, not doing a tough mutter, but she was able to walk a mile around the block. She was able to, you know, go for these evening walks with her husband. And she felt good about coming into the gym and being able to go through the circuits I'd, I'd have her do and not be embarrassed that she was out of breath and not be, feel like she couldn't accomplish it. And I, cause I do think there's a lot of shame involved with clients that you're trying to just get to that level of where they can work out. She was right at the point where we could have probably started some weight loss, but then they moved to California. Ah. But again, I've had, uh, I had an older lady. She was about 61 when I started working with her and she had just joint problems. Her shoulders were killing her and she wanted to be a power lifter. So I never discount someone's pain, but I also never take it as a disability because I've seen far too often that you know, some shoulder pain, you just need to rehab it. You know, let's do, let's strengthen those shoulders. Let's make sure we have a good range of motion. Let's make sure we're not using bad movement patterns that are going to reinforce that pain. 
Same with back pain, same with hip pain. Of course, I'm going to refer them to a physical therapist or a doctor if I feel like we can't fix it or if I, I'm making it worse. Mm. But um, this lady ended up competing. Uh, I believe she, you know, at a body weight of 130, she deadlifted 230, squatted close to 200, and I think she benched about 110. And this was, had never power lifted in her life, 61 years old. That's awesome. And so, yeah, so the, the path is very similar. It's get them started, basic fitness, start teaching them the tools they need to accomplish their goal. For the power lifter, it was teaching her to squat and bench mm. and deadlift. For my other gal, it was teaching her to do the movements and the exercises that we were eventually going to do at higher intensities so that mm. she could start to lose weight. I love that. That's awesome. I just to tell you, there are two things you said in there that I can't help but comment on. First, you were saying the I don't discount people's pain, but I don't I don't identify that as like the obstacle that keeps you from reaching your goal. Like that's something that we can work on, we can work through. I've worked with a largely older population, and most of them would tell you just waking up is painful. Period. Like yes, when, when you're seventy, like you have. When you're 46. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do that too. I, you know, I'm, I've got healers, Dan Lowe's, I'm 30, and, and <laughs> man, yeah. it's just part of the equation. The question is, is it as minimal as possible, and can I go about things in a way that make, uh, make life better rather than worse, right? So I love that you said that. That's a big deal. If somebody's out there wrestling with pain right now, it doesn't mean that you can't make progress. It just means that you have to be a little smarter about it and see what we can do to minimize the, the pain progression. But another thing you said in there, which I don't want to turn this into a conversation about training methodology, but I think this can be really helpful to listeners. And that's the idea sometimes that if you have a body composition goal, then not only building a foundation being an important step in the direction of reaching body composition goals, but having some performance goals that you can work toward. Oftentimes, I don't know what your experience here is, Sarah, but I know when I work with a client and let's say they want to do a pull-up, but they'd also like to lose 10% body fat. Doing everything we can to work on a pull-up not only helps them with the body composition stuff, because we're going to be resistance training, we're going to be doing cardiovascular exercise, and let's face it, doing a pull-up is a lot easier when you weigh 20 pounds less, right? Yes. <laughs> Working toward a pull-up gives us that thing we can check off that isn't as fluctuating as the scale or uh, body fat loss or, you know, whether or not my pants fit really, really well today. And yes. sometimes it seems to anchor the body composition goal in a, a much more measurable realm, or at least that's been my experience. Do you feel similarly? Yes, I do. I, in fact, that's the only reason I train. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but unless I have a date on the calendar, my motivation level goes in the toilet. Mm. Uh, and so that's part of the reason I decided to do a figure competition because I knew it would keep me honest. I, I love that. So it's a, it's a beautiful segue. Let's talk about this decision. Okay. So you've never done this before. You started nope. training with a figure competitor. Okay. And, and so you've had what, I don't, again, I don't want to date you. What is that? 20 years? Like you've had 20 years to think about this. <laughs> Maybe not quite 20, but yes. And you know, I think part of it is the divisions in figure and bodybuilding have increased oh, quite a bit. It used to be, I think for women, you had bodybuilding and you had figure and fitness. So you either had to be gigantic or you had to uh, look good in a bikini and also be able to be a gymnast. And i never going to be able to do either of this. <laughs> you don't it's strike just... me as the lift weights to look like a man or like yeah. jump off of things with one foot kind of. So yeah. I mean, what are you, what's the competition? What is it that you're training for? Um, so I'm doing figure, which if you want to look at it in, there's a bunch of different federations, but in the NPC, the National Physique Committee, you basically start at bikini, which is lower, uh, lower body fat, but you're not really ripped yet. Mm -hmm. um, they usually have an emphasis on shoulders and just nice form, feminine. Um, when you get to figure, now they want to start seeing your six pack. They want to see muscle definition. Um, again, a little more feminine, but that's where you, you, you're not going to mistake a figure competitor for some, you know, average gal. Okay. Gotcha. And, and then you have physique and then I believe bodybuilding is at the top and the physique and bodybuilding that's hardcore. Like that's mm -hmm. maybe a little help from some ergogenic aids, <laughs> but, 
but you know some people are naturally like that and and hard work does pay off mm. over many many years but uh so i actually thought about just doing bikini because i know i've got muscles under my fluff like i've got big traps i've got a big back i've got a big butt um and that's not fat, it's, it's muscle. So I, I've always thought that like, if I had the discipline to kind of diet down, then underneath of that is probably something resembling someone who could, you know, stand on stage and not be embarrassed. Uh, of course, I, the first thing I did was hire a coach because I don't know anything about this. <laughs> and ah. <laughs> she decided based on, and accountability, uh, as mm. we all know, we are our worst coaches, which is how I got in the predicament I was in to begin with. Uh, she saw my back and was like, you're doing figures. So that's, <laughs> that's how that decision was made. But that's you know what, what basically happened is uh, I've had this happen to me twice now. I, the first time I was coaching a weightlifting team that I took to nationals. And when you're a coach, especially of performance-based athletes, especially when it really counts, like they've got to be, you know, practicing four or five days a week. They've got to be on top of their game. They've got to fit in their weight class. There's a lot of psychological stuff that goes on there. You're, you know, and I don't know if this is unique to me, but as a, a mother and a female, I get a lot of that psychological nurturing that I have to put out. Mm -hmm. Uh, and on top of that, I've got my own kids. So I find that when I am spending a lot of time coaching, my training goes by the wayside. I have a really hard time doing more than the basic things that I need to do to stay fit enough to do the things I want to do. And like I said, I tend to put things on the calendar to train for. In the past five to seven years, I've been competing in Highland Games, which is uh, throwing competitions. It's based on uh, the original Olympic games of, you know, discuit and, and shot put, but it was, I guess it started in Scotland with farmers throwing trees and logs and rocks and stuff. Um, That's awesome. So it's, it requires a lot of strength and power. Uh, so I trained a lot with barbells in the gym and then I practiced throwing. And I guess about two, two, three years ago, it was 2016, Every once in a while, I realize you've got to do some cardio <laughs> because <laughs> as we all know, as much as us strength coaches like to say, you can do your cardio by doing more reps, that's actually not true. We do need cardio, even if it's on a very basic level. But can I do anything at a small scale? No. So I decided to train for a half marathon with my son. Okay, wow. So here's what happens when you, and I'll, I'll tell you, as a coach, I always tell my people, do as I say, not as I do, because <laughs> all my power lifters and weightlifters, I insist that they do some amount of bodybuilding type accessory work to keep their joints healthy. Mm -hmm. It is necessary. I don't care if you can squat 400 pounds. When you are squatting 400 pounds and that's all you're doing for your legs, think about it. You're in one position and that you turn yourself into a human forklift. And the human body is really good at adapting. So at first, when you first start squatting, it's like, oh my gosh, she's putting weight on her back. We've got to turn on all the muscle fibers, fire every, everything. Every muscle responds to yes. that. Yeah. As you get better at squatting, the body's like, let's conserve energy. Let's figure out what we can turn off because now her hips are strong enough to keep her knees out. So those knee stabilizers, we can turn those off. And she's really using a lot of her hips and posterior chain. So we'll keep the back strong and the upper part of the quads and hamstrings strong, but we'll just let the rest of that kind of go because you're in a fixed position, you're not moving, right? Mm -hmm. So I could say my hips and legs are very strong in that squat position, but I go out and start running and guess what? My knees are very unstable. <laughs> several stabilizer muscles that have since kind of relinquished their duties, right? They did. And um, I ended up with uh, some pretty bad knee bursitis. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the worst. Yes, it You're is. Like a and, caged bird. <laughs> and uh, I'm stubborn and I ran the half marathon anyway. With uh, knee bursitis. Well, yes. You, you pay for that. I did. And, you know, it was one of those stupid things you do as a parent. Like my son wanted to run it and I couldn't let him down. And so... Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. Um, 
after giving birth to him, you know, it's like, <laughs> what more pain could I put myself in for you? You know, whatever. <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, that was not a really good idea. And then I came back to wanting to throw and I did not do what I should have done. I should have spent a lot of time strengthening my knee, knee joints. I actually had gone to a physical therapist and that's exactly what she told me to do. And I did it for all of a month and then stopped. I went right back to lifting. And I found myself with both knees now hurting, going up and down stairs. And there's a really funny thing that happens uh, in your body because all your muscles are connected. My shoulders started to go. Uh, because my uh, hips were working so hard to try and keep my knees from falling apart, uh, they relinquished their duties for my upper body. And that's just a weird thing that happens. The older you get, the more often you'll see it happen. There is really a big connection between shoulders, hips, and knees. And so by January of last year, 2018, I could not even bench an empty bar without pain. And walking mm. both up and down stairs was killing me. And I was about 20 pounds overweight. Like it was one of those horrible moments where you stand in front of the mirror in your underwear and you're like, I am not hot at all. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm not hot. That's good. I mean, I'm sorry, but we've all been there. We've, we've all looked in the mirror and gone, who's that guy yeah. or girl? <laughs> so I knew I needed to lose weight and I just, I had been trying on my own. Um, but again, I was in the middle of coaching a powerlifting team and I was coaching cross country and lacrosse. And so I was like, I need, I need my own coach. I like, I've been doing all these great things for all these other people and they're having great success and making their weight classes and, mm -hmm. you know, not getting injured. And here I am, I'm injured, I'm fat and I <laughs> feel awful. So I, I Ugh. decided, you know, I need to do bodybuilding. I need to, uh, cut weight. And what does that look like? That looks like a figure competition. So I love that. Well, th first of all, thanks for being so open about the personal journey there. I, I like as, as trainers, I think it's pretty frequent people will talk to us thinking like, well, you don't struggle with your own health and fitness. Like you're a trainer, yeah. <laughs> but it, there's a difference between like knowing the science and coaching our people to do what needs to be done. And also not, not to say that we don't practice what we preach, but you know, life happens on our front too. I've got a one month old, you know, you don't get any more sleep deprived than having a one month old. And guess what kind of nutrition decisions you make when you're craving carbs and your testosterone's low, like, ugh, it's not fun. Right. So I, I appreciate you being open about that because it helps other people to really understand, like, look, even if you know what to do, there are life obstacles there. Are, you, you said the, the mom thing, it's a parent thing, the self-sacrificing schema. Like, I, you know what? I'll put my body and my time and my energy, all that on the altar to help other people do their thing. And after you do that for like eight months, you're like, whoa, yeah, exactly. <laughs> what happened to me? So you got there, you made the decision, hey, I'm going to do a figure competition. So there's a mind switch in there, I would say, where when you decide to run a half marathon with your son, that's a performance goal. Like that's a set in stone, 13.1 miles. You know, there's a certain way that you train for that. And then to say, you look in the mirror and you're like, I'm not hot. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not hot. And, and we're going to do something about that. You know, when you make that change in your mindset, what had to change in your lifestyle and your exercise and your nutrition to start pointing you in that direction? Because so you hire the coach and she starts saying things like, hey, your lower trap say not bikini. You're definitely a figure chick. Um, <laughs> like, okay, great. Cool. Now what? What started to change for you then? It was quite a challenge actually. And quite a lot of things changed that first three months. Um, so I have a gym in my basement and it's mostly dumbbells, barbells, bands, pull up bars. And the exercises she was giving me were more machine based. And she told me, you can do whatever version of these feels good. So if you want to do it with a band, you want to do it with a dumbbell, you want to do it with a barbell, that's fine. I'm, I'm happy with that. Just make sure you get the volume in. So two things happened. Mm. One, I realized that I had not been training volume in a long time. <laughs> and that was very, <laughs> very humbling. So a lot more reps and a lot more set. So overall, I was doing, you know, uh, 75 to 85 reps of each exercise and mm. it was divided by body parts so six to eight exercises 
for each body part. So I'd have a leg day, I'd have a arm and shoulder day, I'd have a chest day, which I haven't done training splits like that in gosh, 10 years. I used to right. do, you know, I, I typically train by doing a large compound lift and then, you know, whatever I feel like I would want to mix in with that. Sure. So like, I think the most humbling thing was walking lunges with a barbell. And I very quickly realized that I could either do full range of motion lunges with no weight, or I could do really, really, really shallow lunges with just the bar. Because like I said, my, my knees were in such bad shape. And so the, the very first thing I really had to come to grips with was you are not going to be lifting heavy. You have to do the movement, you have to do the range of motion, and you have to get the volume in. So those first two months, the workouts were taking me an hour and a half to two hours to get through. Now I get through them in 45 to 50 minutes, but the amount of rest I would need and just trying to think my way through it, it was very humbling. It was extremely humbling. Uh, and then I realized that's, that's like, you're like after like two weeks, you're like so sore yeah. everywhere. You're like, ah, what is wrong and with something me? Something started to hurt worse, and I wasn't sure of myself. Like, do I give up? Like, is this bad for me, or is this just the growing pains? So I figured, well, if it doesn't hurt while I'm doing the exercise, I'll give it some time. What What made you stick with that? Was that trust in the process? Trust in your coach? Was it, you know, hey, you know what? Screw it. How much worse can it get? <laughs> yeah, well, it was trust in the process and trust in my coach. But also, I know that inflammation that happens after the fact is, you know, can sometimes be a danger sign. But what we're looking to see is that we're not making it worse. And so if I can come back in and do the same exercise the following week and it doesn't hurt when I do it, it only hurts two days later, I'm going to keep going with that. But that is, you know, one of the, the big things that I'm a huge proponent of is keeping a very detailed training journal because you're not going to mm. remember that unless you do that. So, yeah. you know, if you have to stop, for example, now the, the next thing that happened was I realized I can't work out in my own gym. It's in my basement. I will get sick of doing what I'm doing. I will cut my reps short. I will come upstairs and find a reason to check my Facebook uh, or do something else. Or, you know. Contractor will come to the door. The contractor will come to the door and I'll just forget <laughs> about it. So I actually went to one of the local gyms down the street. It's like $10 a month. But they have a squat rack. They've got benches. They've got all the machines. And the other thing was there were some exercises that no matter how I tried to modify in the gym were painful. For example, uh, flies, chest flies, which mm. you can sit on a machine and do sitting chest flies. The only way I could do them in the gym was laying on a bench. And when I did that, it really hurt my shoulders. So I knew in order to do that exercise, I, I needed to get onto a machine. So that was my second humbling experience because I hadn't been in a commercial gym again in probably mm. 10 years. Um, and I felt I was embarrassed because here I am, I'm a powerlifting coach. I'm a weightlifting coach. I've, I've had people win world championships and here I am back in the commercial gym, barely able to do leg extensions with 20 pounds. That's hard. That is really hard. That is hard. And I was chubby. <laughs> so... <laughs> So I, I, I struggled a lot. The first three, four months, I was like, my ego was just, you know, let's just stick some more pins in it. But again, <laughs> you weren't coming from a real strong place to begin with. Oh, good Lord. I, I just trusted the process. And, and the, then the, the nice thing that happened was in April, my husband and I took our kids to um, the Grand Canyon. And for the first time, as you, as you know, it's, and, and actually all over the West, we hiked a bunch of places. My knees didn't hurt. And I was down about 10 pounds at that point. So my pants fit and I felt good. And the cardio that she had been having me do, which was literally like 20 minutes, uh, three times a week, just on an elliptical or something, my conditioning was better. So that was the first time I was like, this is actually really good for me. Awesome. I'm glad I'm going through this process. How long did that take? Like from the, I'm barely doing 20 pounds on the leg extension and my, please don't ask me what I do for a living. Cause I don't want to tell you I'm a trainer right now. <laughs> like I don't want yeah. to, how long did it take to go from there to, you know, the April I, I'm on a hike. I feel pretty good. That was about three, three and a half months. Wow. 
So yeah. I, I just got to say this fellow trainer to fellow trainer, but also uh, friend to friend, like high five chick. That's because that three and a half months is, I think I caught So you have this like initial, I'm really excited about my goal and I'm starting to make progress. And then you feel the first few really sore times and some of the ego shattering times. And then like two months in, I call it the valley of the shadow of death. Like you're yes. literally like you're at this point where you're like, you know what? Screw it. This is awful. Why do I keep doing this to myself? And you don't see the results and it hurts and it's it's not easy. Your your ego's shot. You know, you've got plenty of reasons in life to stop, but you don't. And then then you start to see some light and I don't know, high five. That's really hard to get through. <laughs> Do you have any any tips, tricks, or is that just a stubborn grit kind of thing uh, for anybody going through that? It's a stubborn grit kind of thing, but I think it goes back to perception. And again, train like a scientist. It, it takes time. The one thing I know from being a coach and from being a, a researcher is it takes time to make changes happen, especially changes that are real and are mm. going to stick around. Mm. So... I could go on a liquid diet and drop 20 pounds in four weeks, but you know what that is. That's, you know, glycogen, a lot of water, and probably the entire contents of my intestines. And <laughs> that will come back in four days if I start eating normally again. That's right. Right. So I, I think it's more important, like if you want long-term changes, you've got to go for the long-term goal. And to be truthful, like by the time we went to uh, the Grand Canyon, is the first time I could sleep at night without my shoulders waking me up in pain. My knees did not bother me hiking, uh, but they would still be sore at the end of the day. But it was another two or three months before the, I got back to benching like 125, you know, for reps. Mm. And that was a miracle day. I was like, wow, I didn't actually lose it. It was just, I was in pain. And that's one of those things that I, I tell a lot of people, you know, there's a, pain inhibition is a real thing. Yeah. And a lot of times we think that we're going to lose our abilities if we take time off to take care of those injuries. I've never seen that happen. I've always seen people come back stronger if you take the right approach. Mm. So I think I know that as a coach and a trainer and because of my training education, but I've also seen it happen multiple times. And so that's, I think that's a really important thing to get across to folks when you're trying to get them to take care of themselves mm. and say, Absolutely. you know what, maybe we need to just sit back and put some things off and really work on the rehab. And so some people think I'm crazy, but I took the remainder of the year to continue to strengthen my knees and, and improve myself because I knew when I finally went into contest prep, it was going to be really, really hard. And I'm actually in con, I'm 13 weeks out right now. And oh, right. I'm tired and I'm hungry and I, I weight train five days a week. I do cardio four days a week and I'm still, you know, I'm coaching lacrosse. I'm trying to ride uh, a couple of horses a couple times a week and I've got three teenagers, but because my body feels good and I'm not dealing with that, you know, pain and having to deal with all that other stuff, I'm, I'm, I'm good for this process right now and it's working. You don't have nearly the bags under your eyes that you should, given what you just said is on your plate right now. <laughs> That's great. Uh, we all adapt, and I've adapted to going to bed at 8 o'clock every night. <laughs> <laughs> when you well, don't we, have toddlers and infants in the house. Well, we, we still go to bed. We just don't sleep very well. We just yeah. stay in that room for a long time. Yeah. So <laughs> but let's talk then a bit about the nutrition that you've had to change over this course. So I, I appreciate you bringing us through what, what it felt like and, and what the changes were in the isolation sort of training, those that we call bodybuilding splits in the training world. Very, very different from your compound movement, get stronger at your squat kind of stuff. So tell us about the nutrition stuff. So it's very different when you're training to, you know, throw a really heavy tomahawk as far as you can or whatever it is that you're throwing. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a very different eating regimen than, you know, I'm going to stand up on stage and I'm going, as you, as you like to say, hey, I've got, I've got a good looking butt. I just got a little fluff. I'm, I'm you yeah. know, working on. While you're working on the fluff, what, what does that nutrition look like for you? And uh, tell me about some of the challenges with having teenagers in the house. That'll, that'll definitely throw a wrench in things. Yeah, well, the diet that my coach has me on, which I think, in my opinion, is probably the best um, for me anyway. It's a very high protein, moderate carb, very low fat diet. Uh, I am always a proponent of carbs, especially for athletes, especially mm -hmm. for training. Like, you know, even 
when I'm trying to get my athletes to cut weight, I only put them on low carb diets for a very short portion because I've found that it, with ex, with a few exceptions, uh, when my I can tell when my athletes aren't eating them because they can't last the training sessions. They don't mm -hmm. have the energy. So it it actually hasn't been too difficult because I do tend to prep cook a whole lot of food at the beginning of the week, and I've always sort of put things on the table that my kids can eat, like. Uh, for example, orzo pasta with uh, Parmesan cheese and some peas and lots of butter in it because they need those calories. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to eat that. I'm going to have, you know, my asparagus <laughs> and, and they're going to also eat the asparagus. But one of the things is sort of deciding, you know, when you put food on the table at night, you know, what's your protein? What's your, your carbohydrate? What's your, what's your vegetables going to look like? And I usually, like I said, I try to put one calorie loaded thing for them because they're all playing sports and they're growing and all that other stuff. Mm. And then I try to keep my choices pretty, uh, you know, the rest of the meal, I can eat it without having to, to make any big sacrifices. Can we stop down on this for a second? This is like a hugely practical tidbit. All right. Even if you're not trying to get ready for a figure competition, if you're a parent feeding your kids, they're developing They've got, they're going to nuke through most of those calories as long as they're active and not hanging out on their iPad all day. Like they're, they're going to nuke through those things and you're not developing anymore. Like how much more are you going to grow? After? You're going to grow out. <laughs> you're going to grow out. That's right. <laughs> uh, so unless there's a reason for you to be consuming about the same amount that they are, like, let's say I'm training for a marathon. Okay. I'll, I'll probably eat the same number of graham crackers as my toddler. Okay. Like I'm going to use those. But outside of that, unless there's a reason then they're eating differently than you. But what a lot of people do that, that puts a lot of change pressure on this is they go, okay, well, I have to make two dinners. I have to make one dinner for these people who can eat these things. And then I have to have my chicken and broccoli all by myself over here, which like in my world, that's just, it's hard enough to cook one dinner. Like it's, it's hard enough to do that. So I love what you're saying here. It's like, hey, plan your meals such that you've got your protein, you got your veggies, and then you have your high calorie, maybe carby thing that maybe you need to cut the portions on or not have any of it all. And everybody else can eat that and that's fine, but it's not two different dinners. It's you're just being intelligent about planning the meal in a way that everybody can eat at the table with the same dinner. Is that what I'm hearing? Because that's just genius. Yeah, absolutely. And the other really, I have to pat myself on the back for this one. The really it. genius thing I think I've come up with is, um, and I probably didn't come up with this, but I think I did, <laughs> um, is that, uh, you know, carbs at night tend to get stored more readily than carbs during the day. And actually, you should eat the bulk of your carbohydrates around the times that you're active both before and after. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm only on about 50 grams of fat a day and that limits your protein choices. So typically right now I'm having about six ounces of chicken breast for breakfast. Um, yep. The remainder of the day, I have very low fat um, protein so that in the evening I've already eaten the bulk of my carbs, but I can have higher fat protein. So we can have steak for dinner. We can have salmon. We can have you know, or I can make a, maybe a more fatty sauce or something or have a little mm. more olive oil on my salad or whatever. Um, so again, that's another way that you can keep the family from having to eat grilled chicken breasts every night for dinner. Or like you said, I'm going to sit here in the corner and cry with my tilapia and broccoli. <laughs> but I can sit down at the table and eat it. Now, granted, I, at this at this stage of the game, I do have to weigh my portion so I know exactly how much I'm getting. Mm -hmm. But that's not really a big deal. And Here's an important thing. Um, eating disorders with kids are huge these days, not just with girls, but with boys. So I made a conscious decision and effort to explain to them what I'm doing and why. Mm -hmm. And so they know that I have a specific goal in mind and that I'm a full grown adult and I am not growing and going through puberty and all that other stuff. And it, it's a huge deal. Yeah, so that they understand like, oh, this is just the same as me going down to the gym and, and squatting heavy. My goal is to reduce my body composition and no, it's not going to be something I, I walk around with all the time, but this is my goal and this is how I have to achieve it. That's such a huge deal because as an adult, a three or 400 calorie deficit is just going to make you a little tired and hungry. Whereas if I'm a 15 year old female, a, a three or 400 calorie deficit, especially if, if I'm doing that regularly, 
my body's not stupid. It's going to start pulling resources from my organs and stuff. Yeah. Like that, with people with bulimia and anorexia who've wrestled with that, they actually end up with deteriorated density in their, their heart walls and stuff. Yeah. Like that's a big deal, you know? So I, I love that you were conscientious enough around that. And, and to anybody listening who has fitness goals with children in the house who have some, you know, developing prefrontal lobes, make sure you explain them what the heck you're doing and why. Because a, a 10-year-old, a 15-year-old, a 16-year-old, their fitness goals and their journey are going to look very, very different from how you would go about it as a developed adult. Yeah. And I, I even told them, I'm like, look, I'm going to be tired. I'm going to be hungry because this isn't natural. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> right. I told my, my son, I was like, we need to come up with a safe word. So if you think I'm a little too crabby, <laughs> you know, be like, okay, I'm sorry. I'll go eat my chicken in the other room. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, I think, you know, educating them on, on why you're doing something is important because otherwise they're going to try and emulate that behavior. Mm. And likewise, like, you know, when we go out to a restaurant, I, I try not to be one of those people that's like, I can't go out to eat. All most restaurants these days have nutrition information online. So you can go online and, and look up and, and so you've already made your decision about what you're going to order. Because it's hard to go to a restaurant and they you look at that menu and like, I want the extra double cheesy fries. <laughs> right. Oh, bad girl. <laughs> That's great. They don't count on Fridays. On Fridays, I don't have to count those toward my. <laughs> so they're, I think, I think they're, they're good about it. And, you know, so every once in a while they'll be like, mom, what are you going to eat when you're, you're off your diet? And we have these great conversations about pie and wood uh -huh. fire and all this other stuff. But <laughs> so for now, I mean, it, I think it's, it's working well. And, uh, and also my, my workouts have gotten more, you know, regimented. So I've taken some things off my plate. I've uh, rearranged my schedule a little bit and I've, I, I know this sounds a little, but I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. I've made myself less available to my clients mm -hmm. because the mental drain of dealing with, you know, a lot of, when they can reach you 24 seven with everything, it can really take it out of you. So mm. I've limited, you know, how often I respond and how often I, you know, talk to them. Usually it's just during the sessions. And I, I usually try to answer their questions, but I have found that, you know, with some people you give them an inch and they'll take a mile. <laughs> and that, you know, is, a, is something that I think as trainers, we really have to be cognizant of because you only have so much you can give to your clients and your family. And that all comes from the same well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's very well said. That's a really important thing for <clears throat> us as trainers, but I mean, I, I would say this widely also extends to the, the world of parents. Not that you can tell your kids, hey, you can't text me after six. It's just not going to, I'm not going to respond. Like <laughs> you can't, <Yeah. laughs> can't really tell your kids that, but it's the idea that uh, one of the things you can do as a coach is you support somebody as well as you're able, but at a certain level, the more self-efficacy you can foster in somebody the less of a drain they are on you and the more they find in themselves that they can fall back on which is yes maybe this journey in uh in being a figure competitor in this this time frame for you will result in some more self self-independent people who are coaching under you it could be pretty powerful yeah and i i think that's important because like i said i it's easy to overextend yourself and especially when you're coaching athletes and I think that teaching people, I've always felt that that's more powerful. If you can teach them to be independent, I've never had a problem with someone saying, oh, thanks for that tip. See ya. Usually they want more because when they realize they can do it for themselves, it, it opens up a lot of opportunities and a lot of uh, vision for them that they didn't even think about before. If you can mm. say, look, all we have to do is this. I'm going to teach you how to do this part. And then let's think about moving beyond that point that you always thought was impossible. I think that's kind of magic, honestly. Yeah, I love that. So we're, we're coming up on our time here. I could talk to you about this for a while, but I know you've got obligations and I'm sure you got some cardio to do today or something. So. Oh, I already <laughs> did it. <laughs> I already did it. I'm good. I'm, I'm, you get my post cardio endorphin high, Alex. Thanks for that, Sarah. I appreciate it. So uh, the last thing I wanted to ask you about then to kind of summarize this and then that hear about what's fresh and passionate in your mind right now, what would you say you've learned from this whole situation? If you had to summarize it in one or two takeaways, what would you say you learned 
about maybe yourself in this training regimen? I would say, even though I probably knew this was true, it is always a great idea to step outside of your comfort zone and learn something completely different. You know, it's easy to sit from the outside and, and like you even said, you know, the, the strength world, we don't always buy into the whole aesthetic thing, but there is a lot to learn there. And there's a lot to learn from a lot of different places, even maybe not training related, but it was humbling. And I'm really glad that I, I did it. I love that. That's, I appreciate that. I had a conversation on the show probably about a year ago now. I sat down with a good buddy of mine, uh, Mike Davidoff, and he's a strength coach who had just started training for his first physique competition. And we had a conversation, not even close to what we're talking about now. He doesn't have teenagers, <laughs> he doesn't have, but the idea being that there's something different about this kind of training that you'll only learn when you step out of, outside of your comfort zone. So if you're somebody out there who's always training for body composition, Maybe you need to contact Sarah and talk about the strength thing. Well, actually, don't contact her. She, are you taking new clients right now? I don't, <laughs> I don't know more plan, on your plan That yet. remains to be seen. <laughs> that remains to be seen. All right. Well, you, you could tentatively reach out. But then in, in, on the same vein, if you're somebody who's always been you know, really performance driven, you train for marathons, you're trying to make your squat heavier and stuff, maybe considering whether or not this is a great time in your life to step outside of your comfort zone and try something new. Because it is mind expanding. And you realize that, I mean, no matter how, how good you get at something, there's always a little more to you that you didn't know about, or at least that's been my experience. Yeah, and I've actually been trying to share a lot more of this on my blog. You know, the whole concept of train like a scientist. Think about, you know, conceptually, what, what can you accomplish stepwise? If all you have to do is identify where you're going, where you're starting from, what are the tools you have available, and, uh, because I would like to get more people thinking in that mindset instead of saying, I've got to do X and the people doing X do this, so I've got to do this. There's actually much smarter ways to go about a lot of this. Mm -hmm. And definitely getting outside of your comfort zone and learning a whole bunch of different disciplines uh, is going to teach you a lot, not only about those disciplines, but about yourself. Couldn't have said it better. So Sarah, you have 13 weeks, you're 13 weeks out from your competition. If people want to follow this progress, maybe high five you, um, you the virtual slap on the less fluffy <laughs> butt. Um, if, <laughs> if somebody wanted to connect with you on that front, how do we get in touch with you? Uh, I am on Instagram as have fun, get strong. I also, I'm on Facebook and, uh, have fun, get strong. And then I have a, a blog that I write on is uh, have fun dash get strong.com. And I, like I said, I share a lot of my training philosophy on there, but you can find me. I'm pretty easy to awesome. find. Awesome. I'll make sure that the, the links are posted below in the show notes as well. If you're listening to this and you are a guy with a wife who has kids, I would highly recommend getting them connected to Sarah's step if they're the least bit interested in anything health and fitness related, simply because. I mean, I, I like talking about science, but at the end of the day, I'm a man, husband, and father. I'm very, very not well-versed in talking about what it feels like to be the lady standing in front of the mirror going, I'm not that hot right now. Like, so <laughs> that's, a, that's a big <laughs> deal. Uh, but secondly, if you're listening to this and you just want to see what the journey looks like, Sarah's done a great job documenting that. So I've, been, I've, I've kind of been creeping on you for like, well, we're, we're, we're mutual <laughs> colleagues, I guess, but I've been creeping on this process because it's just, it's really cool to watch a, a fellow trainer step outside of their comfort zone and do something different for themselves. So high five, girl. I've, I've enjoyed your journey. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alex. <laughs> um, it, do you have anything else you'd like to leave us with? And uh, then we can uh, wrap it up and call it a day. No, just, uh, I have been doing, uh, like I said, the train like a scientist and then also meal prep like a foodie because uh, I love food. Mm. So I've been putting a lot of recipes on my Instagram that are both healthy and easy to prepare. And uh, I let you know if they're kid friendly or not, but I, most of my food is kid friendly. Kid friendly as in kids would also eat this or kid friendly as in like strawberries Romanoff, there's a little bourbon in here. <laughs> no, kids kids will actually eat it. And my kids are very picky. So. Oh, okay, so so Sarah stamped it kid yeah. friendly. It's approved by all uh, all of her teenagers. <laughs> yes. Yeah, 
Yes, indeed. Awesome. Well, Sarah, thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm, I'm rooting for you, man. This is going to be an awesome, Thank you. awesome show. I appreciate show. you having me. You got it. And to the listeners, guys, thanks so much for jumping in on the Defining Dad Bod Show. Until next time, kick butt, take names. To help us leave a legacy of health and fitness for our kids, go to www.patreon.com slash definingdadbod. We've got great rewards for you there, and even $1 a month is appreciated. Patreon.com slash definingdadbod.